Hello everyone, and thank you. My name is Chili, and I am the curator and license holder for TEDx Cape Town. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, or for whatever time it is, wherever in the world you are joining us. So this is our Intersections of Change digital program. And this is a 10 part series of online content where we're engaging with thought leaders and change makers from across the TEDx community, finding out how they have adjusted to a world with COVID-19 and asking them to share insights with us that we may not have ourselves. And our conversations span intersections of change from social, economic, educational, cultural, tech, and more, giving us an opportunity to better understand how we and the organizations around us are adapting to the current times. So before we get started, I would just like to thank our partners um, who make this entire series possible. So on the first, I'd like to thank the US Consulate General, the United States Consulate General from Cape Town, South Africa, Missing Link, Workshop 17, PayFast, Black Wolf, Sir Fruit, and others. They are the people who make these conversations possible, and thank you to them. Now, this is going to be our second conversation in the series, and we are chatting to none other than Rich Mulholland. Now, Rich is a past TEDx Cape Town speaker, but he's also an entrepreneur, owner, and founder of a renowned presentation company. He has authored two books and was voted one of Mail and Guardian's top 300 South Africans to take to lunch. In 2018, Rich spoke on the TEDx Cape Town stage, and in 2019, he spoke in 26 countries on six continents. So Rich is definitely somebody with something to say and somebody that people want to hear. His talk on the Cape Town stage talked about taking small leaps versus aiming, taking small steps versus aiming for giant leaps. And he had this thought that for about 99.9% .9 of us, the real opportunity for greatness comes not from creating the future, but fixing the recent past. I found this point very interesting, and so I decided to catch up with Rich and see what he was up to. He told me about five things that he was currently using that helped him and his business find their feet and move forward to normal. And we thought this would be a perfect opportunity to discuss what those five points are with you, our audience. So allow me to introduce Rich Mulholland. Rich, welcome. Hello, everybody. Hey, Chidi. Hey, Rich. So How's it going? Hey. Very, very good. How's everybody in the chat? Good to see you all. Hello, hello, hello. Um, dude, I'm fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, a, always a privilege to be on one of your stages. Um, Chili is one of the most intimidating human beings, and I don't know why, because he's so nice. But like, I always feel like I just do not want to let this guy down on anything. He's amazing. If you ever have an opportunity to, uh, to work with him on a TEDx project, um, consider it a privilege. He's really, really uh, incredible. So thank you for having me as part of this. Thank you for being here, Rich. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, so Rich, when we met last week, we kind of discussed and we kind of said we will have this conversation a little bit different. Um, so you're gonna run us through your five points and at the end of each point, we will kind of have a short conversation Q&A, digging deeper into each one. Uh, before I hand over to you, in 2018, you ended your talk by saying something along the lines of, we must stop asking ourselves, what will we do tomorrow? And rather replace it with, what can I do today? Because something that was invented yesterday. Um, so Rich, over to you. What can we do today because of COVID-19 that happened to us a few months ago? Brilliant. All right, everyone, thank you so much. As Chidi mentioned, um, it's, it's gonna be quite interactive. We wanted to make this not just a standard like you know, me delivering a talk the whole time that I'll be talking to you, but also talking with you. So please get those questions uh, going as much as possible. The other thing about this one that's quite different for me and it has me quite nervous is that I want this to be more gestalt. So I'm a member of an organization called EO Entrepreneurs Organization. And we talk not about giving advice, but about having an experience share. And a big part of this story started with me realizing that I wanted to map out and kind of almost like go through the journals of how we behaved during this whole thing to try and figure out if there's anything I've learned that's re replicable. It's my belief that this is a big crisis, but we certainly know, you know, my business is 23 years old, uh, that a uh, crisis has happened. So I, I wanna go into the next one without taking the learnings of this one. And what I wanna share with you is the five steps that have worked for me, and I hope some of these will be relevant for you. And where this all started was actually with a conversation with a mate. So on the 20th of March, we're about like five days after this whole thing kicked off, I, I phoned a mate uh, who's a speaker, he's based in Europe, and we're on the phone. I said to him, how's things going? What's happening? And uh, 
uh, you know, what are you doing? And he said, you know, I'm just kind of sitting this thing out and I just I just kind of want to kind of wait and, and, and for things to go back to normal a little bit. So I'm working on my website and stuff. And I was like, dude, like, are you crazy? Like, how can you be sitting waiting? This is absurd to me. Like, I already felt that there were five days too late. And he said, like, well, what do you want me to do? Like, what 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 would you do? What, do, what am I supposed to do? And I realized at that moment I didn't have – a sense of it, but I did turn around to and say to him, I said, well, I'll tell you what isn't going to happen. This, this, this idea of back to normal doesn't make any sense. I think what we need to be doing is understanding that we've got to go forward to normal. Uh, you know, Jazz and I, my wife and I, we finished watching this TV show last night. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet. It's called Defending Jacob. If anybody's seen it, let me know in the audience. It's very cool. Uh, it's a really, really great show with uh, Chris Evans. I'm not going to do any spoilers, but there was one great line in it that I was like, oh, I've got to remember this. And they said, you know, about this idea of like, you know, when are we going to get things back to normal? And he said, well, there is no normal. There's only before and after. And I think that, that he's only half right. There's before, there's during, and there's after. And I want to suggest that we're still a little bit in the, in the during phase. And uh, I think it's something that we need to be thinking about how we act. And the reason I'm still comfortable sharing these experiences with you is I still think there's time to change things. So let me start by giving you a bit of context, right? This is my world. This is the world that I live in. I live in the, in my business has been built in the space and even me as a speaker are built in the space of live audiences. We exist where audience exists. You know, so there's somebody standing up, delivering a presentation. We've hopefully helped them organize this from a content point of view. They're on stage. We work with staging companies, event companies, and all of this um, uh, uh, will come together. I see Taryn in the crowd today. Hey, Taryn, uh, that's great. She's one of our event partners. And, uh, you know, we try to bring these to get people together and then share knowledge to this massive of attention that exists. But then we have to all remember this date here where everything changed. So on the, what's it, the 15th of March, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa declares a national state of disaster, imposes travel bans, and says that all events, live events, are going to be shut down. This is before the lockdown was announced, but this was all live events were, were not were shut down. By the next day at 10 o'clock, uh, Missing Link's company revenue went to 0%. Literally, literally every single uh, client that we were doing work for contacted us and said, it's on hold or we're canceling it. We cannot do our event anymore. 23 years, I'm 45, I've had my company more than half my life. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before, zero. And then by lunchtime that day, my speaking revenue, which was my backup plan always, you know, I earn money and I go and I travel and I speak, I get paid for it, 0%. We went from appealing to rooms like, like we had to this. And I promise you, I was super, super nervous about this. However, about two weeks before that, I was lucky on an online event that I was attending, and I heard this guy speak, and he said this quote. His name is David Newman. He said, abandon the road is never fatal unless you forget to turn. And that thing had been kind of playing in my mind quite a lot. I'd been thinking about it quite a lot, and I thought, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. Like, we just need to remember to turn. This doesn't have to be fatal, even though at the time it looked like it was, because, like, we lost all of our income and we lost all of our audience. And... What people often say to me is, oh, you guys pivoted. You know, this is this is a great example of a company that pivoted. But what I want to say to you today is that we didn't. You know, he says forget to turn, but he just means it's just a bend, right? We So many people are pivoting all the way, and we didn't do that. We never pivoted. What we did is we took one small step. Uh, we, we embraced this idea of atomic adjacency. A friend of mine, Matt Sims, he calls this one step adjacency. I quite like the, uh, the assonance and alliteration kind of atomic adjacency and it's the idea of what could i do that would be so small that would still have the halo effect of our reputation but where we could we could actually uh, continue to serve our customers so i had to look at you know because i didn't want to make a big step i didn't want to go back and start from nothing i wanted to start from where we were and then solve a new problem so I kind of went back and looked at what we do. And I guess the easiest way to do this is go to, say, our website. And it says, you know, so what's the problem? Presentation strategy, you know, presentations, conferences, blah, 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 blah. How can we help you? And the only word that I had to add to that was the, the comma now. Like, how can we help you now? What problem do you have now? And once we did this, this was me already starting to form the first step um, in my head of what we wanted to do. But then I had to get into this first phase of our five-step plan. And that started, and you'll see when it started, basically on the same day. This, if you have a look at the date there, that's March 15th. On the same day, 
that the president addressed, we went out to war and you'll see a line there. Uh, talk about going to war. I have no respect for companies canceling their conferences. Right? I originally, I mean, like, and I didn't because my argument was very, very simple. If you were canceling your conferences, why were you doing them in the first place? Was it just about bringing people together or was it about sharing knowledge to humans? Because that can still happen. And that brought me to my first thing is to know who your nemesis is. You have to know who you're fighting against, right? So our belief was from day one, you have to take your event online. And we went to the point of trying to force people to, to answer the question, why were you throwing your conference in the first place? And for me, my enemy, the day one enemy for me was people canceling their events. I had to attack that thinking and make them realize, wow, I can't do this anymore. We have to do that. So that's that's point number one. Step number one was, I think a lot of people didn't know who their nemesis was. They thought their ne nemesis was COVID-19. COVID-19 is a distraction. Spending any time looking at COVID-19 will distract you because you'll think that's the problem. You're not dealing with that. You're dealing with the aftermath of that. Or you're dealing with the, with the, the, the side effects or the ripple effects, the butterfly effects of that. So we had to change this. And um, uh, Robin, I'm actually going to refer to the article you're talking about in a second, because that was the beginning of the next step of our journey. So step number one, know your nemesis. Chidi, you want to put back up and maybe we can discuss this a little bit? Yeah, thanks for that, Rich. That was really interesting. Um, quick question for you on that. Would you say that there are some industries where atomic adjacency may not necessarily be the right move, that knowing the nemesis may require them to pivot? Or do you think that every industry is in a position to kind of just make an atomically adjacent move in the right direction? Um, I think, look, there was a time where that wasn't the case. So the atomic adjacent move of you in retail was to maybe uh, go online, but that wasn't necessarily possible in South Africa because a lot of online deliveries weren't even allowed. You know, if you're a restaurant, maybe you couldn't go immediately atomically adjacent, but this idea of dark kitchens and things like this uh, would change things. I do have a friend in retail though, who owns a furniture business, Mobelli in Seapoint, and he started creating these virtual fur uh, furniture shows where you could actually use VR to place items of furniture, pre-order at a discount that would be delivered after the fact. And he's actually built now an international base, a retail store that's actually built a new way of working from two weeks into the lockdown. When everybody else was panicking, sitting at home playing games, uh, you know, starting their TikTok accounts. This guy was reinventing his business. And the truth is, his business will be better afterwards. My belief, and you guys can all hold me accountable to this thinking, is that when we fast forward three years from now in just about every single sector in the market, uh, every single sector, somebody will have come out of this thing better than they were going in. And the decision is uh, be that person be the one who comes out of this winning. And I think that a lot of us are happy to sit back and wait, and I'm not sure that's the right idea. Every problem that exists in the world creates a market for new solutions. And as entrepreneurs, we should always be in the business of fixing a problem or filling a gap. So more problems means a newer, bigger marketplace for solutions to the current new problems. So I do think in the many spaces, you could take that atomic adjacency. All right. Um, and with that, just to build on to that a little bit more, would you say that figuring out how to do some, what you do in an online space is kind of part of making that that move, that everyone has to figure out some way to get online in this post-COVID world? Or do you think that there are some businesses that might be able to still make a, an atomically adjacent move while still retaining some element of being offline? Um, yeah, totally. So again, uh, a friend of mine, and this doesn't sound necessarily atomic adjacent, adjacent because it's a, a, a big step change, but uh, he's the main distributor for uh, Skull Candy uh, in South Africa, earphones and things like this, which first of all was a big market because people needed more earphones and things like this. So that was a great thing. So he could do that, but he couldn't deliver them. But what he did have is a market to retail, to contact to people. And he does under, he did understand how distribution worked and how buying uh, cycles worked. And so he got onto the market very, very quickly with regards to masks. But where everybody else went and, and sold my masks direct to public, he went to big properties that he'd worked with before, like Orlando Pirates, and, and negotiated deals with them for branding rights. Went to Disney, went to places like this. So his, his thing was, how do I take my knowledge of dealing with partnership uh, with partnerships and apply it to uh, earphones. How do I take dealing with partnerships and apply it to this thinking around this? So in Dustin's case, his genius wasn't that he understands that he's in the in this 
uh, uh, other market that goes beyond just the product he moves. That's one product problem he solves, but he can solve a different one. So while a lot of people just pivoted to masks and things, he took it to a higher order problem solving and said, well, what am I good at and what am I trusted for? And he said, well, I'm trusted with these big brands uh, to do co-branding. How can I accelerate that today? Uh, and so that was an offline pivot. Uh, you know, they already had an online way of selling and distributing. But this was a case of, say, again, you, it depends on the problem you're solving for the world. Cool. Thanks a lot, Rich. Um, just the audience, just a reminder, please pop your questions, ask a question. We'll be asking Rich questions now and at the end. But if your question is relevant to one of the points and you want an answer in between, please pop that question in. Perfect. Thanks, Rich. Point number two. Cool. Thanks, Jay. So point number two was this, narrow the field. And this is a tricky one because, so once you understand, as soon as I understood that, you know, don't cancel canceling your conferences and all of these things and take them online, all of a sudden I looked around and a hundred people on LinkedIn, every single people who were our clients or suppliers or, you know, on either side of us, if you were involved in this industry, all of a sudden you became our competitor. Every single person was saying the same thing. Let us help you get your product online. Now, you want to narrow the field. I always talk about when you're selling anything, and when we work with people from a presentation point of view, we always say to them, imagine a horse race, and it's a five-horse race. That's a really, really crappy race, because then you've got to try and convince people to like you a little bit more than the other person. We believe that there needs to be a four-horse race, you versus the best of the other, uh, uh, sorry, a two-horse race, you versus the best of the other four. So we saw that everybody else is trying to take people's events online. We were like, okay, well, how do we mitigate that from the equation? And then we said, well, let's just tell them how to do it themselves. Let's make sure that is not the conversation. So the next day on the 16th, so day one, Cyril does the announcement, we come out and go to war and we, 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 we attack our nemesis. Day two, we separate ourselves from the crowd. We start giving away tools to people for taking their conference online. We start saying to them, hey, you don't need help. You don't need our help to do this. Just go and take this online. I just pop this out there, get it into place. Here are some tools. If you want to, to do a host an event, a theater style event, go to this venue, Crowdcast. If you want to host a, uh, a you know an event with more a larger group, you can do it on Webinar Jam. We start sharing platforms, tips, what to do, where to go, and letting people just go on and do it themselves because we knew that that wasn't when they were going to hire us for it. We didn't want them to hire us just to get them online. We wanted to get them to hire us to be better when they were there. Because the challenge here, you see, isn't that people, that the hard bit of online events isn't making online events. In fact, the barrier to entry is really low. So we wanted to make that even easier. The, the barrier or the real barrier is not being shit when you're doing it. And so that's what we wanted to help people try and create this extreme experience for people once they got on there. And there was other little things we did there as well. Like, so if you can see here, we, we kind of said to them, we immediately announced, you know, come to our event free on desktop uh, conferencing, how to rock a desktop conferencing. And so we put out there already that we were going to tell people how to do it themselves, by themselves, super easy in a week and a half's time. Now, confession, I write this blog post and we create this event at this point when we had already recommended Crowdcast. And at this point, when we already said that we were going to come up and do uh, uh, a, a, a event on the platform, I had been to one single event on Crowdcast by the CEO of Crowdcast, basically a welcome tutorial. We had no idea, but we knew that we had to start getting out the gates very, very quickly because it was going to be a bit of a land grab. So we said, book the time in the future, and we went out and we did that. The other thing we wanted to try to do is start, try and change the language. So we, we talk about different things like venues, and we use venues, and we use this idea of desktop conferencing to change the language. Everyone else has said, hey, guys, we'll take your conference online, or we'll help you through a webinar. We were like, no, okay, we want to separate ourselves from that crowd. Uh, what is your platform? We knew that everybody was saying, well, we're a Teams company. Shit, we can't work there. Uh, we're a Zoom company. That's not where they're going to hire us for. So we started using this language of different venues. Your Crowdcast is your theater venue. Your, your Zoom call is your office auditorium. You know, uh, hop in, that's an exhibition center. And which venue is going to be right for you? So we created a gap in our audience's knowledge. So then they're like, oh shit, well maybe we need to book a call with you guys to try and help us. So step number two was very, very simple. It was simply us separating ourselves and trying to narrow the field to, to make it easier for our customers to get online and then realize, wow, this is harder than I thought. Let's go back to the people who sent us here for the advice. So step number two, you got to narrow the field. Chili? 
Thanks, Rich. Um, with narrowing the field, uh, the section of narrowing the field, would you say a big part of that is kind of showing, giving away content and kind of letting people know that you are one of the people who has something to say in this space? Well, that's going to be part of it, but it's not that in itself. That's because it's going to become about what content are you giving away? Because if you're giving away content and, you know, here's three steps to do this or do this or, you know, that could be put it depend. You've really, really got to be very, very important about the language because you want to make sure you're saying something different to every other peer in the space. So again, we realized, as I said, all of a sudden there was everybody, anybody in any space in the events industry was trying to help people take it online. And we needed to make sure that we were having a different opinion to everybody else about the challenges of taking things online. Even now, a big thing for us is a lot of people are getting fancy. So they're building these big 3D virtual sets and they're saying, come into these virtual sets. And then you stand there and it's your whole body. You know, hi, everybody. I'm standing here doing this thing. This is shit. I'm so far away from you. Yes, I decided it could be better, but it's not engaging. This isn't like a step up. In fact, in many ways, the reason people are enjoying events like this is because we're close to the camera, because we're talking directly to people. Every single person in this group right now has a front row seat to this event. And so, so now we're going to war with the idea of these big 3D novelty virtual sets and jump in as an avatar and walk around an event like, like crappy 2007 Second Life. That's not a level up, but people are trying to sell it. So we've got to make sure that people buy into our thinking, get better up close and personal than their thinking, which is this. So that's the thought leadership we have to do, which is, I guess is a segue into the next step as well. Okay, before we get into the next step, there's just one other point that I think that I wanted to touch on. When I, I liked when you said about the five horse race and taking that into a two horse race. And that kind of reminded me of this thing that Simon Sinek says in the infinite game about kind of finding a worthy rival and somebody who you can compete against in that space. Um, were these, was this five horse race, two horse race, an existing person in your space or, or somebody in the new space that you slightly adjusted to? For us, it's always a different problem that we're solving to everybody else. So in Missing Link, everyone, everybody in the world talks about having a USP, a unique setting proposition. We say that's less interesting than having a UPS. And a UPS is a unique problem that only you can solve. So. If I'm standing up there and I'm invited to do a pitch and there are five companies pitching and all five companies say, hey, the problem is this and this is how we would solve it. The problem is your idea for your big conference isn't creative and exciting enough. So they're all selling how to solve big creative idea problems. And the only answer to that is big creative ideas. So they'll all come in with their big creative ideas and then it comes down to the customer on the day which idea they like the best. And so maybe that could be a preference. Well, I once saw a really big insurance company conference get awarded to an event company who recommended high stools. That was there. That was the thing that, that really, oh, I really like that. Instead of conference chairs, just high stools, cocktail chairs. That sounds like this. Million Man Conference went to somebody who recommended bar stools. By the way, sounded like a nice idea. An hour and a half sitting on a bar stool, not fun. I digress. When we pick for a conference, though, we want to go in and say, okay, well, what is the what is our um UPS, the unique problem we solve, we turn around and say, everyone is telling you that creativity matters, but actually what matters is activating your audience at the end of your event. It's not about how fun it is. That has to happen, but that's just a ticket to the game. We want to solve for respecting your audience's attention and activating that audience to change at the end of it. We believe most conferences are bad because they don't make a change at, after the event, not because they're not enjoyed during it. If you do business with us, we want to solve better tomorrow, not and um, more fun today. If you want more fun today, choose between the best of the other four there. So separating yourself from a different problem, then either the customer starts nodding and thinking, yes, I agree with that, or they agree with the others and then you weren't gonna win anyway. So yeah. that's what I say about narrowing the field. Solve a different problem to everybody else and then sell that problem. We always say sell the, ambul sell the accident and the ambulance sells itself. If you can convince people that that is the real problem they need to solve, then that's what they'll go for. Yeah, that makes a lot of, yeah. So the, so the other four horses are running a different race and you're just differentiating yourself completely. Totally. Perfect, all right, let's uh, move on to point number three. Cool, so point number three is very simple, is give them a reason to believe. So once you turn around and once you've convinced everybody that uh, uh, this is actually the problem we're solving, you've got to now convince them that you're the person to do it. 
Now, years ago, I remember this guy, uh, Mike Stockforth, he walked into my office. I'm talking years ago. We were all blogging about 2001, 2002. We all started blogging. And then, you know, a few years later, Mike, who at the beginning was working at Extreme 16 in four ways. I don't know if you guys remember that. It was like the place that's all the four by fours. And this guy walks in and says, um, <laughs> Dear, if this is for you, don't say I don't do anything for you. Okay, I don't just my audience. That's for you. Right, so. This guy, Mike Stoffworth, comes running into the office. He sits down and he says, I really love what all you guys are doing, but I think you should be doing it as a business. Like, I want a partner with a company who's going to be doing this as a business, doing this. And he went and spoke to all of us, and all of us were busy, and we didn't put up our hand. And he turned around and said, you know what? If none of you want to be experts in this space, I'll do it. So I kind of coined after this phase this idea of stop for its law. In any area that lacks an expert, whoever puts up their hand first and says, hey, I'm the expert, everyone is like, sounds legit, and they believe it. And so, so I realized I wanted to get some stop for its law of my own. I wanted to find a way to try and make sure that everybody thought of us as the experts. Even if, and <laughs> thank you, even if um, uh, anybody else, even if uh, no, everybody else was trying to do it, I wanted to make sure it was us. And even if we weren't sure how to do it, I wanted to build the parachute on the way down. You know, I see Deb um, earlier in the chat and we were talking, we talk about EO and entrepreneurs organization. And we always talk about like the kind of motto being, uh, you know, you jump off a cliff and then you build a parachute on the way down. And that was every single bit of the last few months for, for our business. So I wanted to go out and give people a reason to believe. So I started doing some thought leadership stuff. The first thing I did was I wrote this article, you know, how to deliver Zoom presentations like a pro. I went out there and I, I knew that people were presenting online and we created this little video as a, a, a kind of, just a little bit of a tutorial on how to present online. And a lot of the stuff, even now, I, I no longer think is the best way of doing it. But at that point, we didn't have to have, some of you think you have to have an eight out of 10 level of knowledge or a, a master's in the topic you're offering an opinion with. But actually, often that's a bad thing. What you want to do is have atomic adjacency to your client's current level of expertise. So if your customer is currently at a two, if you offer them knowledge at a three, that's a step they can get to. And then next week, they're at a three. You've just got to be one step ahead of them. You then offer them knowledge at a four, and then that's where you get them to and move on and move on like that. So that's what we have to try and, and do is just get a little bit of ahead of your customer. So we started making people believe that we were the experts. I created this other piece that was uh, referenced earlier. What happened if this was the best thing in your business? You can see we're now at like March the 20th. Uh, and I really started believing it was that, hey, there's a massive opportunity there. We're building towards it uh, and we should be working towards this big opportunity that is facing and trying to rally it. And then even within this article, I use this as an example of how we were evolving our business and changing our business and trying to drive people to engage with us. And even out of this already, we started having people contacting us saying, hey, can you help us? We're like, cool, this is great. And then it came to the day of the first event that we were throwing. So now we're at, what, the 27th. We're 12 days later. Now, bear in mind, that is, I had never, I stand on stage to deliver a talk, how to rock a desktop conferencing, literally the first time I've ever presented on Crowdcast, the first time I have ever presented this material, and the first time I've ever delivered a webinar in my career. I had done Zoom calls and presented via Zoom on EO calls and things like this, but I'd never done anything like this. Luckily, the kind of number one rule of not sucking at presenting online is, you know, try not to suck too much presenting in person and, and build up uh, from there. So that was it. We went out there and we shared what we thought we knew. Again, this was knowledge that was atomically adjacent to our customers. It wasn't a master's degree. It wasn't high pollutant stuff. It was just one step, little small tips that we thought we'd figured out, you know, being two weeks maybe ahead of them in, in what we were looking and watching as many videos as we could to figure out and then move on from there. It really was a case of faking it till we make it. Luckily though, again, and as I mentioned in this kind of article here, our customers already trusted us for presentation and their skill in with regards to this. So we didn't have to start from nothing. In fact, I still stand by the fact that if Missing Link still fails, if it goes out of business tomorrow because we've taken a misstep here, it won't matter because we still have a domain name, we still have an email address, and we still have a reputation. People will still email us for advice the next day, and we'll have a leaner business to solve it, to solve afterwards. 
So that's what we got to. And we started building this. We At the end of this thing, and what we'd been doing in the 12 days leading up to this, is we'd been designing this new product that we thought all of our customers were going to love. It's Missing Links Conference in a Box. It was a, the conference ready mix. You buy a conference that we pre-created. We could run it for you anywhere in the world with international speakers. We had listed them in four different events we'd made, two guest speakers, interactive sessions, everything. And I was absolutely ready. Now our customers believe that we were way ahead of the curve. By the way, the only thing we had made in this product was this slide. We had not made anything yet. We had the speakers lined up, we had everything ready, but we were gonna wait for the first customer to pay us for this event before uh, we actually built anything. We made one slide and we sold it. And that was how we generated what became step three, a reason to believe. Chili? Thanks, Rich. <laughs> um, so that's really interesting. And I just think, um, what if it was obvious that you were kind of new in the space? How would you give them a reason to believe? Would it be by writing? Well, you, you wrote blogs in your case and, and that kind of interest and, and did some conversations. Is there other ways? And how would you kind of make people feel comfortable that you're not as new as they may think you are? Again, it was OK being relatively new because everybody was new. So, uh, you know, in the in the in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king kind of thing. Uh, you just have to be one step ahead, which was which was fine. And you yeah. can use any number of platforms. So whether it was in our case, up until this point, I didn't ever realize, and let's use the term webinar for what it was, like a sales vehicle. I didn't realize how powerful online events were as a lead generation tool. We didn't even real we couldn't believe the response we got after that first event. So there is things like do online events. Uh, videos. It's super easy to make videos. And for some people, we try to edit ours and put them out there. But I've seen some people do an amazing job of putting um, uh, their their uh, just you know phone camera in front of them, driving to work and sharing some ideas. The only thing I'll share is that what I have seen, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, is that a lot of people are just sharing generic smarts. But so what they're doing is they're they're broadening people's respect of you. So, wow, I knew that person was a cool guy, but actually knows quite a bit about this, and they know quite a bit about this, they know quite a bit about this, quite a bit about this. That's not what you want, is you want to invert that triangle. You actually want them to think, hey, this person is smart, but what they actually know is about everything about this. You want to get to the point where you're unavoidable. And a case in point for us was the other day we had a customer approach us, and they said, you know, it's so funny that, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to be speaking to you because I'd spoken to three different companies that I trust in three different parts of the country, asking them for somebody who can help us in this online event space. And they all said that they have to speak to, to you guys. And I thought, this is insane that this has happened considering our first event was under three months ago in this, in this space. But, but again, you've just got to go out there. And the biggest thing is to narrow your conversation. If you look at me in LinkedIn or outside of the regular kind of jokes and rants, all my thought leadership material has gone from being broad about all the opinions I have to narrow as anything. Basically, I'm trying not to have an opinion about anything other than presentation. I'm not talking about entrepreneurship. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about presentation and presentation online as the, as the, the niche narrower. I want to be known for one thing really, really loud rather than lots of things really, really quiet. And I think that's the mistake a lot of people are making in the reason to believe. It's just a reason to believe in me, not a reason to believe in what I can solve for you. And, and how do you kind of gauge what it is that the people, your potential clients are interested in hearing about? Do you, do you go out there and do surveys? It's based on conversations. How are you kind of gaining the topics where you sharing an opinion on it kind of gives them a reason to believe in you? Well, we took, and, and again, this is going to go into where we went to. We took a bit of a stab at different things. I mean, we just thought, so we knew definitely that the only answer, only problem we could solve was something to in the online event space and taking an event uh, somehow online. By the way, the other thing we realized quite early on is that we had to change that mindset of, yes, Robin, absolutely, the essentialism idea of really kind of narrowing it down. We realized that it wasn't about taking an online, an, an in-person event online. That was another thing we went to war with. We said, anyone who's telling you that they can do that for you, they're already off the, off the, the track. What we are saying to you is we will solve the same objectives you had with an in-person event. We will try and fulfill as many of those objectives as possible with an online event. But the event we must build is an event that was designed to be online first. 
solve for what you can do there because there's a whole bunch of new exciting opportunities that we can do there and not worry about replicating or simulating what you had in the in-person space. We had these opinions about lots of things and we thought everyone was gonna buy things. In fact, that product that I, I described was our first stab in it. And we did two or three different products that we kind of threw out into the market, into the mix to try and figure out what would work. We even did a call to action where we, we said we'd hire anybody salespeople, anyone who was in sales who didn't have something they could sell at the moment because of lockdown, we offered a commission on one of our products. I thought this was gonna be amazing. Everybody in South Africa is gonna sell our products. This is phenomenal. 30 people arrived on the call, nobody sold anything yet. But it didn't matter because we were generating conversation. We were, and we've talked about this quite a lot, we were throwing spaghetti on the roof, trying to see which one would stick at the beginning. So I was rapid firing, you know, ready, ready, fire, aim, ready, fire, aim, ready, fire, aim, trying to shoot out ideas until we figured out what the market wanted. Too many people are going ready, aim, 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 and then waiting to fire. And I think that's the wrong approach here. Yeah. There is um, a question, and just to the audience again, just remember there's a Q&A kind of happening at the bottom, so please post your questions. You can upvote a question that's really good. We have a question from a, a gentleman named Jason, and um, it's kind of relating to a bit to, to the previous point, but I think it ties in here. And he basically said, is, there, is this an aspect of creating a niche or just reframing to come across as unique? Well, I think, so I think you should always want to narrow your niche as much as possible. I realized that very early when I started Missing Link is that uh, when we started, we did, we we're called Missing Link Interactive. We did interactive CD-ROM, screensavers, websites, all of these different things. Then we started doing some video. This was two or three years in. And we were still based above Billy's Plumbing Supplies in Alberton, like it was uh, humble beginnings. And I remember saying to the guys, we, we've got a terrible business, a stone throws business, which is still a term I use today. And I kind of walked the guys up to the window at, at our office in, in Arbiton. I said, oh, we could throw a stone and hit somebody else who does what we do. No one's ever gonna find us. Like our, 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 our quantum of influence is too narrow. If you are an interactive design company, your quantum of influence is you know one suburb because there's hundreds of people doing what you're doing for a market. So we wanted to do two things. One, we wanted to define our, our target client avatar. So we didn't want to deal with small companies. We wanted to deal with big, large corporates. And the other thing is we wanted to be known for one thing. And we thought the one thing that we could do that nobody else wants to do, we were already quite passionate about was presentation. So we narrowed our niche to become the presentation guys. It was my original stab at Stockworth Law. If nobody else is deciding to be South Africa's expert in presentations, yeah. why not us? Again, I started my business um, in uh, 1997. And I did my first ever presentation for money, my first ever live presentation I did after my son was born in 2003. So that long was purely based on just thinking I know a little bit more about PowerPoint than you did with no actual experience yet. We were still very much the skinny chef. And uh, only the first time I got onto a stage and delivered a presentation like I was asking my customers to deliver was in uh, October of 2003 but we knew that we wanted to own that niche and find a niche in which a lot of problems exist and start solving them there. At the beginning for us, that was figuring out PowerPoint. Afterwards, it was figuring out how to be a better speaker. Cool. Um, Dustin, asked a question, uh, Dustin has asked a question here in the comments that maybe yeah. are just worth addressing because it's relative to this point. Go for it. Dustin, for us, it was very specific that uh, I knew that if, if somebody came to me and asked me to buy something uh, from them, say a website, and a website was 50,000 Rand. I had to think long and hard about this 50,000 Rand was kind of like coming home and saying to my wife, listen, I don't think we can afford to go on holiday this year. I really need to buy a website. When it's your own business, 50,000 Rand is reaching into your pocket and paying for it. The second thing is if my business runs into a problem with a, you know, an SME, well then you know, that does affect my suppliers. What I quickly realized in large corporations is they don't have money. They do not spend money, they spend budget. And budget is a, is a cell in an Excel spreadsheet or in a database. It's an allocated amount of funds that they have to distribute to suppliers and it's not their money. A person who worries about spending, uh, you know, 100 Rand on a Woolies meal on the way home would think nothing of giving us 100,000 Rand for an event. And then the second thing about it was you always get paid. Big corporates, they'll always pay you late. So they'll pay you on their terms, not yours, but they'll always pay you like money in the bank. If one of the big banks in South Africa says, if you sign a contract, they pay me in 30 days, they'll sign the contract and then 90 days like clockwork as per their agreement, they don't care about yours, you will get that money in your account. 
every time. And I like the security of that. So we knew we had to wait till we're in a cash flow window. But once we figured that out, we solved for it very quickly. Perfect. Uh, right, over to back to you, Rich, point number four. Okay, so point number four was um, give them a reason to engage. So once you've given people a reason to, to believe, and you have to give them a reason to engage. Why should they contact you and talk to you further? And again, this goes back to this thought leadership problem that most people are having. They're giving you a reason to believe, hey, this guy's super smart, really, really like this, but what am I supposed to phone you for? Like, why should I phone you for this? So we thought, and this is what the link was to that last event, we thought the reason to engage was this, our conference ready mix, give us a call. And it turns out it was absolutely right. People saw this, they clicked on the little call to action button at the bottom of, of, of Crowdcast, they engaged with us. And do you know how many of these things we sold? Any guesses, how many of these we sold? All right, I'll tell you, none, a big fat zero. Not a single person bought one of these things. But once they engaged with us, we started asking them questions, saying, oh, so they're saying, yeah, look, you know, we're not quite ready for this yet, but we do like the training aspect. Yep, Robin, we do like the training aspect of it. We do like um, what people are, uh, you know, what you're looking at there. So we immediately went, and Deb just quickly popped this up on our website. If you go to missinglink.com and you've never been there before, this pop up, and we realized this is something we could do straight away. We could take our already bo our boredom stairs training and we could take that online and start training people there. We could make new training specifically how to present on video conference. And we immediately launched that and we started selling that straight away. And once we sold the first one, uh, we, we, we built it and we've now done loads of those. And then how to sell on video conference. So, because we realized that our normal old structure, which was in a one hour sales meeting, there's a ratio of you presenting for 20 minutes to, to delivering uh, you know, 40 minutes of interactive because when you're talking, you're selling, but when they're asking, they're buying. And we realized that had to change. So we wanted to come down with this idea and that we'd refer to as 10 minutes to win it. So your 10 minute pitch, how do we figure that out? How do we sell online in just 10 minutes, your whole product? And then we realized the most important thing, the biggest frustration the market had is that because these platforms, these venues have grown so quickly, the support is zero. So we said to our customers, hey, we're going to be your cloud crew. Imagine you're walking into a venue and it, like all the lights are off and you need a technical crew, just like you would normally need in an event, to take your event online. And we would say to them, the reason you need us is because if you try log today, do a test for me, log a, a support call with any of these platforms, venues, anything, hop in, webinar jam. If you get a response back within 10 days, I'll be surprised. Right? That doesn't happen. But so what we said is, well, okay, cool, we'll help you do these things. And we looked at all the things our customers were coming at, and we told them all the things we would say. And the only reason I'm showing you this now is this was literally just, we wanted to solve for the things that other people weren't solving for. And um, that's cool, Kev, you can unfocus that. So we wanted to solve for the, the aspects of the job that our customers, we knew they needed. So we said, yeah, this was a reason to engage. Come with us and we'll help you run the event in this space. We'll help you make sure that, you know, like Kevin will prime your audience at the beginning of your event. We'll have people, as you've seen in the chats here today, we'll have people engaging with you, sharing links, doing things, trying to keep the conversation going. There's a reason that there's a conversation happening today is because we've got people in there making sure that you guys keep speaking, that you have permission to do it. And we know that that's what you need. So that was it. Step number four was just give them a reason to engage. Now, this sounds so simple, but this is where most of you are, 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 are mixing it up, is you're not giving people a very obvious reason to engage with your company. And I cannot tell you, just think about all those people in your LinkedIn and your Facebook that are everyday prolific sharing things, and you think, wow, I've seen them 100 times. And then think about how many of them you think, like how many of them you can place for what you would want to buy from them. And if you're not sure what you want to buy from them, then all of this is actually noise, not signal. Right? They're just adding to the conversation and they're maybe brand building, but actually I don't think we should be brand building at this stage. When there's problems like we have right now, this isn't brand building, it's business building. Chili? Um, so Rich, we are kind of short on time. So I'll let you just go straight into point number five. Uh, then for the audience, we're going to be bringing you up for the Q&A. Uh, we'll, won't bring everyone up, but um, we'll bring one or two of you. So just keep an eye out from a message from uh, one of the team who will ask you if you're fine with putting your camera on. And then after the fifth question, we'll get a few questions from the audience. Um, and then depending on time, if some people are keen, we may stay on a little bit longer, if that's okay with you, Rich, to answer some questions. But we'll aim to make sure that we wrap up within the allocated time. So, uh, Rich, uh, on to the next point. Cool. So the final point is once you've figured out what people want to engage you with, with you on, 
Once you've figured that out, like this is the thing that they want. This is the bit of spaghetti that stuck to the roof. Once we figured out what that was, double down. Own that in everything. I remember years ago, I was at actual TED Global in uh, Oxford, and um, Jeff Bezos was there. He wasn't speaking. He was just in the audience. And I went up to him the day before, and it's quite funny if you can see what's on uh, on my Kindle. I was always embarrassed for a while that it was Eclipse from the Twilight Saga. Um, and so and I'm, I used to make a joke about it. I apologize for reading that book, but, but hey, I loved it, whatever. And until somebody told me and spotted the one that I read at the bottom. But um, anyway, so I love my Kindle. I'm still a big fan of my Kindle. And I went up to... Um, Jeff Bezos one day and I saw him, I was like, dude, could you mind signing my Kindle? So he writes his customer's rule. Anyway, the next day he announced that he bought Zappos, the shoe company. And he was on, he did this talk that day online and it was like a video you could watch. And I watched it from my hotel room in Oxford. And I was like, this is so slick. This guy's just done this slick presentation, but it looks like he's done it backyard of a courtyard of this hotel. And I went to him the next day and I said to him, dude, you just did this, this talk that we would only coach people to deliver a talk of this level, but it really looked like you did it out of off the fly, but it was perfect. <laughs> anyway, so I went to him and I asked him, but like, how were you so sick? How was this presentation delivered so well? And he said, well, I've got to let you in on a secret. Do you remember what I wrote on your Kindle yesterday? I said, of course. I said, I wrote, you wrote customer's rule. He said, that's it. He said, that's all we've got. He said, Amazon is a one trick pony. We only have one thing we have to solve for every day. It's customer's rule. That is it. That's the only thing we're solving for. I wonder how many of you right now are in Amazon Googling that book. Like, hey, well, you know, I'll have a look. You never know. <laughs> we can all do with a bit of improvement. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, that's what he said. He said, you know, we're a one trick pony. And I said, dude, but it's a great trick. He said, yes. He said, that's the one secret to business. You, it's okay to be a one trick pony provided it's a really good trick. And what we'd figured out is solving people, the aspect of online events that we were solving was a great trick. So once we figured out what our good trick was, we doubled down. I started writing like arbitrary little things like, and look at this, I mean, it's a terrible clickbaity video title, but that's what we needed. Not knowing this trick could ruin your next presentation on Zoom. We wanted to get people earning things. And again, every conversation that we had was around something to do with how to present better in this online space. We knew that this was what they wanted, not how to take their event online, but how to be better at doing this once they got there. Well, how we could help their CEO present themselves better in this forum. How to set up little things like your camera setups things. We came up with this thing called the teapot method. We wanted to say the fisting method, but we realized that was definitely inappropriate. But the right height, small little things, this right tip about making sure your hand is just one little fist. Some of you are probably doing it now, even though you can't see yourselves. That is the, the right height to be. But figuring out that, sorry, yes, the top knot, that's what we're calling it. Now I remember, we're, we're rebranding to the top knot. So you got to check your top knot. If your top knot hits the top of the screen, then you know you're the right height. But this is the kind of stuff. And so we double down, double down, double down. And as of this date here, as of the 19th of May, our company revenue got back to 100% of what it was pre-COVID with 100% new products. So it took us 23 years to build up a business that reached one certain revenue target. And by the 19th of May, we were able to come back up with all new products and achieve that same target. And we were a better business because of it, because we doubled down these things. So. And maybe, Chi, I'm just going to keep on driving through to the end just because I am uh, aware of time. The most important thing I want to say to you is this, is that it's not about going back to normal. And it is absolutely about saying that that's no longer an option and to try and challenge yourself to go for to normal. And the reason you need to do this, the reason you need to get to this point is this. Future you is watching. Future you is watching how you behave during this period of time. And we're still in it. I promise you, we've been, we had the before. There will be an after, but right now we're in the middle. And future you will look around and they will turn around and they will hold you accountable to the decisions that you've made over this period of time. And you need to be making decisions that future you will be proud of. So I want to leave you before we go to the Q&A with just that list of those five things that I want you to look at your business and to ask yourselves, your business or your personal brand and how you're doing this, and how you have set yourself apart. Do you know your nemesis? Have you narrowed the field? Have you given them a reason to believe? Have you given them a reason to engage? And then once you've got that right, are you doubling down into that narrow niche that you've discovered? If you've done that, then I look forward to sitting with all of you guys and celebrating at the end of this. If you haven't, it's not too late to start. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for listening to the formal part. We're now going to get you up for some questions.
get going. Let's see if we can get our first person. I believe Rosalie is uh, um, our first person up. So um, let's uh, see if Rosalie can join. Rosalie, are you there? You can see what you're... It might be, we, we can try that, but it might be tricky because of the time it takes to develop. Yeah. up. have to just okay. run. Let me go through the other question while we see if we can get Rosalie on. The most upvoted question was from Mark, and it was, what do you believe in, and why is it important for you to make someone else believe in you? <laughs> I don't know. Um, what I do believe in is I believe that the difference between uh, a leader and a follower is your ability to communicate. I believe that people who can stand up and, and, and persuade people will always have the opportunity to lead people. And that's not necessarily being a boss, right? You can you can have bosses and be a leader. I've seen that countless times in my career, that people who weren't in charge still had people following them. And for me, I do believe that uh, getting people to embrace this idea, this lie that we've been fed, that this is scary to speak. And I mean, I really think it's a, one of the biggest, most problematic statements is, you know, speaking in front of people is terrifying. It's only terrifying the first time. It's like anything you do the first time is terrifying, right? I promise you, the first time you ever eat seafood, you look at a muscle and you eat one of those things, you're like, wow, this is crazy. But like, you know, once you do it, you're okay. I really believe that this is something we have to change. And I think this is a mindset that we have to shift, uh, shift around. Hey, Mark. Hello, how are you doing? Red, Red, you. Do you want to expand on it a bit more? So you were saying, why is it important uh, for me to make somebody believe in, in you? Yeah, so, so, because, Okay, first let me let me introduce myself also to the audience. Hi, my name is Mark. Um, you can catch me on LinkedIn, um, Mark Shower. Uh, a big fan of Simon Sinek, so shout out for bringing his name up. And I'm actually also reading Infinity Game. Um, I think for for me, I wanted to find out more of your personal why, not like on a holistic sense, but more of yours, like what it allows and what drove you to even go through this process. So I, it's my first time getting to hear about you. So I'd be interested because I'm personally on a journey whereby I'm redefining my, well, not redefining, let me call it rediscovering, right? You can say rediscovering my own identity um, as well as looking at what is it that, why does it matter? And why, why am I here? Like on a personal thing, because the belief I have is each person has got a tribe that exists for them, you know, and that comes through the story that you tell. Because essentially, at the end of the day, the story that you tell is, um, you know, you can call it your unique selling point. It can be whatever. But that is specific to you based on the experiences that you've got and based on the things that, you know, you've gone through. And that's essentially when you share it, it and then becomes like a, what you call it. It's like a chain. You know, you share your story. If it resonates with someone, they pick it up and they go on with it. And you find that they come, they come to you. So it's like almost sharing that why of yours as simon sinek would say so that's what i wanted to find out from you like what is your why what is it that you believe in why do you feel that people need to believe in you the person and not just the products you sell um i don't i don't believe that they need to do that so i don't believe that people need to believe in me as a person i believe i only think that they need to believe in me with with regards to sorry let me just pull this back i only believe they need to know uh i believe in me with regards to how far they, um, uh, uh, relative to what I'm trying to sell. Okay, so okay. me, I also, my personal journey, and I'll kind of call this up now and I'll, I'll take you through it very briefly. But okay. I have my personal journey as to what my story is. This is my workflow here. I mean, I can show you what this is here. You can have a look. So the things I want to define, I don't know if you can see that. You can refocus that, uh, Kevo, thank you. So the things yeah. I want to find, Trustworthy, but I like depression, healthy body, healthy mind, unapologetic, tenacity, purpose of a profit, with the securities, make a mark and family first. So that is that. And then the person I want to be, I will focus on living a life of acceptance, intention, and gratitude. I will consume and burn knowledge with equal vigor. I will commit to leading with candor, courage, and empathy. And I must be empowered by my health, not hindered by it. My people will be my priority. My people is a, a wide variant and grouping of people. And okay. so that's... That's not my why, because like I've been doing this, like the, the idea, like as much as I like the idea of Simon Sinek saying, you know, you must know your why. Actually, mm. you must know your why. It's like, you, I, for me, I've just got to know what, what keeps you awake at night and solve for that. Yeah. I'm trying to solve everything. I'm trying to solve for that one aspect of that. 
so I don't necessarily buy into this. I actually think sometimes trying to find your personal why is a distraction. The okay. same reason I think having a purpose can be a distraction mm. because for me, and like, like I'm not a religious or spiritual person, so I believe that we are just, you know, lucky meat and uh, that we, we got to be here. And, uh, and for me, I try not to spend too much. So the only thing I worry about is not what my purpose is, but what hand of cards am I holding right now and how can I best play that hand? Oh, okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. So it's almost so it does it's almost like being in the now, like you're always, as you just mentioned, being present and what you have now is what you work with. Well, yes, but it's also building. You've got to build a better deck, right? So you've yes. got to build your hand of cards. So you've got to decide what game am I playing, what is the victory condition of this game, and how do I get the cards in my hand that I need to play it, and and also look at the cards that we've been dealt. I think for me, wasting any time thinking about cards that I don't have or that I wasn't dealt. Uh, you know, yes, I don't live in Silicon Valley, and it would mean if I was in Silicon mm. Valley, but, you know, it's like a waste of, of energy for me. And uh, so I focus on the the, the, ca the cards I can manipulate and how I can play them. Okay. Manipulate is a bad term, but yeah. Thanks very much, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks for All right, on. pleasure. Thanks for actually answering my question as well. Thanks, Mark. Right, um, okay, so it's the official end time. So for everyone who has to drop off right now, thank you for being here. Um, you will see a link pop up um, for the survey. If you could please just pop onto that survey and make sure that you complete the form. At the end of that form, you can also kind of follow up <laughs> um, with, um, you can also follow up and sign up for our next Intersections of Change series and what's coming next. So thank you for everyone who can stay on. We're gonna continue kind of going through with the Q and A and I believe we have Barbara next. So. Barbara, next question. Hi there. Hi. Thanks Hi. for a really great talk. It, it resonated on so many levels. Um, so thanks a lot. But um, my question that I posted um, earlier was that you know, we are architects and designers. We we got on on onto sort of virtual work pretty quickly, or the tech was easy. But um, the kind of message I'm hearing from just about everybody we're working with is just the intensity of this um, space. Um, you know, and, and the point you made about we're not so far away from each other, you know, at a, at a physical conference, you can duck out to the loo, you can, you can just, you know, you can, you can pull back, but when you've got your face on a screen and you're interacting and it's close, it's, um, and, and you've got your dogs barking and your kids asking questions, it's, it's intense and, and it's exhausting. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on, on ways to mitigate or sort of balance that intensity. Yeah. So the, the first thing was, um, I, I, I don't know if any of you saw it. I was lucky enough to speak at LinkedIn last year. So I'm, I, I kind of see some of the stuff in the stream because I connected with a bunch of them. But the CEO released this post to the team at LinkedIn and said, apologize for nothing. We live in a no apology zone. So if your kids walk in and ask you, you don't even have to apologize, get up and go and deal with them. If your dog barks, don't apologize, just mute your mic and, um, and you know, deal with it. Uh, Kev, you can just share in there uh, L-E-G-A-C-I dot D-E forward slash uh, uh, pro tips and um, and share that in, in the chat for me. There's a link at the top of that to Crisp and it's a really, really great noise cancellation app, which is phenomenal. My dogs go crazy all the time and people don't hear it. However, with regards to the intensity, the first couple of weeks, I was so excited. I was taking, I, I was jam packing my day with Zoom calls from morning to night. I was absolutely flooded and it was incredible. By the second week, I realized that the number one leveling up tip for Zoom meetings was to work out which Zoom meetings I didn't have to have. So we started to having Loom meetings, which is instead of having a Zoom call, we'd have a Loom call, which I would record something or somebody in the team would record something. They would open up an image or a couple of slides and they would screencast themselves, topping and uh, you know uh, talking and sharing their thoughts on this, posting it either on a Google document or a, we use Notion, notion.so, it's a really, really amazing tool. And then we, the rest of us engaged over the next 24 hours. So instead of us all having to be on a call at the same time internally, we said, well, let's turn most of those off and have one or two a week maximum. And let's actually try and make sure that the only time I'm on a Zoom call is when it's um, it's uh, going to be a better, uh, going to be beneficial to the business. The second thing is I, is I stepped on the default time. If you had a one hour call, people would speak for an hour. But if you had a 30 minute call, people would speak for 30 minutes. If you had a 15 minute call, you had a 15 minute um, meeting. And uh, 
the, 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 I realized that we could schedule very, very, very effective 15 minute calls with people and get through a lot because we cut out all, all the extra buffer space. So having less calls and shorter calls and then doing more asynchronously was the number one way to stop the fatigue. Now the calls I have during a day are the ones I want to be having. Um, if you can as a, embrace, I promise you, have a look at Notion and Loom, and those two tools alone will just change your workflow completely with your customers. Uh, Jax or Kevo, if you want to just drop that in the in the chat, that'll be great. Perfect. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I believe we have uh, Rosa Lee who has a question coming up next. Um, and then we we'll probably have about 10 more questions, Rich. So we may just do a rapid fire for the yeah, remaining okay. 10 after, after Rosalie. I think Rosalie will be the last person coming up and then we'll do a rapid fire for the last 10 um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, so yeah, let's see if Rosalie is available. If she's not, let's tackle a few other questions while we've got to come up. Uh, Pravina asks, can we do a part two of this? Uh, and, and there's some upvoting for that. So yes, uh, if, if Rich is up for it, we'll definitely do a part two um, and see how that comes along. Uh, Court asked, will there be a replay? Yeah, so I would like to ask on that is that then what we should do is we'll create a survey on what we'd like to specifically cover in the part two so that we can actually ask and so maybe you guys can submit a whole bunch of questions beforehand and then I'll build a talk on that. on that thing and then we can tackle it from there. Perfect. Um, and then Court also had, will there be a replay? Uh, yes, Court, there will be a, a link put on YouTube and on Facebook and that will be mailed out to everyone. So don't worry about that. You will and get the option link. Above on the top of your page, the podcast.io, that link that you have there, that is the exact same link for the so about 10 minutes after the show is finished, that link will be live with your presentation immediately. So you'll Perfect. be able to watch it now. So that link right. will be available. Please don't share it if you are on the call, just watch it for yourself. Um, and then we'll give you the shareable link um, in, in a few days. Uh, Rosalie, welcome. And uh, please share Hi. your question. Thank you. Thank you both. We're thoroughly enjoying it. Um, we, uh, we sell pest control products, very, very sexy, I know. Um, and so we were an essential service. We were open the whole time. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Great. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned that we might be missing out on something. So you were forced to change, and a lot of businesses were forced to change. Um, but that's less so. And especially now that all businesses are open here in SA, and relatively back to normal. Um, yeah, well, I'm just concerned that there might have been something that we missed by not being hit to badly as someone like yourself. Yeah, I mean, the one exercise I would highly suggest you doing because the next time you might be. Right? So all mm -hmm. of us need to have how we'd be hit if we, if we were. But actually, in this case, I actually do believe there's a bit of a net loss. I, I think that your business has sustained, therefore that your momentum didn't change. So what happened is our business was cruising altitude. And so it was a cruising altitude here at the, the turnover it had been at for many, many years. And let's say your business was cruising altitude there as well. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, everyone was like, oh, that's amazing. Congratulations, you're in a great space because everyone else's business is going down and you were carrying on cruising. The difference is that our business had to accelerate back up again from zero. Your business is still moving. Your mm -hmm. business will some degree move and my business will hopefully accelerate. So I do think there is a degree of a net loss. And I think it's amazing that you've observed that. But I would really want to sit down with their leadership team and say, what would we have done if it, if it all been turned off? And even if it is, I think it's worthwhile and saying, so the question we said to our team is, if we look back at this thing three years from now and said, this was the best thing that ever happened to our business, even that question for you would be worthwhile. <clears throat> this was the best thing that ever happened to our business. And if I imagine that three year from now version of me, 2024 version of me now looks back and says, this is the best thing that ever happened to us. I would like somebody to be able to ask them, well, what did you do? And then have that answer. And I think you need to have that. How could you, even with your business right now, make this the best thing that ever happened to you and decide? So what are the new opportunities that existed? The, the fact, even for me, the fact that people's businesses and things have been open, what are the areas that you could extend what you do to in terms of uh, the other kind of pest control because the biggest pest that we have in the, in the market right now is the virus. So how could we solve for that too? We're already at your office for this. You should use this for that. But I think you should be looking at saying, how can I turn this into an opportunity? And the one question to ask this was, if we weren't an essential service, what would we have done and how can we still do that? And I think everybody should be asking that. Like, what would we do if, if the sky fell down tomorrow and how would we react and change?
Cool. I think uh, we've cool. lost. Kevin, you uh, can you know, we'll bang on to the questions there. Okay. Here we go, Rich. Uh, rapid fire. Um, so these ones uh, were not as upvoted as the rest. So we'll just uh, shoot them off and just give your answer as, as you can. So um, this is from Andre. He says, hi, Rich. Completely agree with the two points thus far. Thank you. Our business and USP is actually with the human engagement part. I understand that this has changed. Is the return to relative normal also something to prepare for? And what would you suggest? Well, it's true. so I don't believe that human engagement, I think, unless you, I, 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 it's hard to understand. Uh, is human engagement a, a, a mental human engagement, like the, the sharing of cognitive ideas and thinking, or does it actually, you know, if you teach tango, it's going to be slightly tricky uh, to, to, to solve for I that. Think, so. I think let's assume it's physical, I think. I think let's assume it's physical human engagement. Yeah, it's very, very tricky. If things are going back, then I think that but you still have, uh, for all of us, are still facing the economic, you know, hangover of this thing. So if you're in any kind of luxury service and you're not solving a meaningful problem, so if you have a USP but not a UPS, a unique selling proposition is we're the best people at teaching you tango. If it, if nobody has a high order problem that is, I have all this time and I want to learn to tango, then that's not. Uh, you know, that's going to be very, very tricky. You've got to then figure out what problem or who in the world has this this problem that I can solve. And I, I do think that we should be navigating our discussions from USP to UPS. What problem am I solving in the world? And is this the problem the world currently has? And if it's not, how quickly can I change? Again, as the business goes on to a, a form of, of normalization, that's fantastic. But then there will be a whole bunch of new problems around that. And how do we solve that there? No problem, Rosalie. It was nice to see you there, and we have you back. Cool. Um, the next question, I think, kind of ties into this a little bit. So it's from Josephine, and she says, the value of an event is often the networking, pressing the flesh, which none of us are able to do at the moment. What can we do to replace that objective with online events for the time being anyway until the next normal? Well, I think the I think one of the values, so the value of networking, um, but I network with an organization, as I mentioned, called EO, and there's people all over the world. And uh, a lot of that networking, whoa, I'm getting drunk. <laughs> She's having a party. A lot of that networking is still happening, uh, you know, in this way. And for for introverts, their time has come. So I know this is Sun City, you're just going to have to go with me on it. I am an absolute crazy introvert. The days that everything opened up and we're allowed to go back out again, I haven't. I still don't leave. This is a level up in everything. I never, if I could never even host this again, I'd be happy. And I have calls with my friends from all over the world online, and I'm still able to engage with them. The best thing is now I can network with people on Sunday afternoon on a 15-minute call with CEOs of businesses that I wouldn't have access to before that I now have access to. So I think we've got to figure out ways to find cool ways to engage that aren't novelty, that are utility. There was a lot of this, hey, let's jump into that. What was that room software that everyone was on for a second? House party. And everyone was jumping into house parties. And I thought, wow, there's a lot of time wasting going to jumping into people's rooms, whereas we were just trying to figure out utility engagement with people as much as possible. For me, I've been able to network this way more effectively than I've ever had to network at an in-person event because an in-person event gives me an audience of uh, one geographical location, whereas an online event uh, gives me a networking effect of thousands of people. And certain platforms, this one not so much, but other platforms allow really, really great networking. Uh, one of the platforms is venues we use called Hopin, and it actually allows people to do speed dating built in as well. So yeah, this is, this is um, there's a lot of ways that we can actually level up even the the, the interactive components of networking even today. We don't have to normalization. Thanks, Rich. Our next question is from the introvert who's loving the conversation <laughs> uh, named Fiona. Uh, she said, how has your price structure changed for online? Do you hope, believe this form of conferencing will continue post COVID? If so, will it coexist with conventional events or is it an either or? And then what, there's a lot of questions here. What proportion of existing track record events will move permanently online? Okay, so I think it's definitely hybrid. So let's let's go backwards. I think some events will move online, but mostly what happens is people realize that they can, because what it's never about is the event. It's always about audience. So access to audience or access to attention is now greater. Well, let, let's just say audience. So your access to, to human audience is now easier because we could host an event like this a week ago uh, you know, think how long, how much far in advance would you have to notify people of a TEDx Cape Town event? 
versus what we did the time on. Like it felt like we spoke yesterday practically. <laughs> and now here we are having an event with all of these people and, and, and it's amazing. So what do we find is our customers have gone from having one big client facing event, you know, a quarter to having one client facing event in a week. So they're not going to stop that. They'll still have the extra special event with their people. But now we can separate the knowledge delivery component. We can say, well, we can now take away the knowledge delivery component. And instead of trying to cover all of this knowledge in that quarter, we can distribute that or drip feed that throughout the quarter. And then when we get you together, maybe just have the guest speaker and the interaction and make it an amazing time for us to network. So the in-person events will now exist for that purpose. With regards to my fee structure, for, as a speaker, for example, our fee structure came down a little bit. One of the tricky models, though, is to work out how much permission you give people. Because now, if somebody books me to speak and they can say, well, can we make it online? To, we want to make it book you to speak, pay your fee, and make it open to everybody in the world today. And that's tricky for us because for my model, there's got to be a ring fence to, to the audience or something. So I've had to figure out a new business model. The other funny thing is, although my speaking fee has come down, I don't understand why this has happened because now I am a staging crew. I've had to buy lighting. I've had to buy camera equipment. I've had to buy microphones. Before I just turn up and talk and do my job, now I have to set everything up, do my own sound checks. It's actually a lot harder doing it this way, but I'm finding it even more satisfying because I get to interact with audiences all throughout the presentation and I'm loving it. I'm actually finding that I'm feeling more connected to more people in the audience than I was before. Uh, before I could connect with some people, but it was at a dinner of like four or five people after the event. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Fiona, I hope he's answered all your questions. Give us a shout if there's anything you, you think needs to be covered. Um, our next question is from Devin, but I don't, I, I see it has been answered, which was if you ever got any acknowledgement for your tongue and cheek dig at Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos for being the first ones trying to get us into space. Um, <laughs> and I see there was a comment there that, um, yeah. So that was actually yeah. Okay, cool. Um, there's a question from Pam. Are the sales positions still available? Um, Pam, if you want to sell on commission, there's always sales positions available. Anybody who wants to sell our product, we have a commission built in for you. So, so yeah, just, just just give us a shout. Perfect. Uh, Robin asks, selling online is way quicker than 10 minutes. Why so long? Um, I'm not sure not what you mean by setting on live yeah. yeah, I'm also not sure. Robin, if you don't mind just adding a little bit of context in the in the chat, we'll just pick that up. Um, Shaka has a question. Yeah. Going through an online sales process is maybe quicker than that. But if you have to have a meeting that you would normally take to explain a complex product to somebody, if you have a complex product that would have taken you an hour to sell in a previous meeting, you've got to figure out how to do that in 10, 15 minutes now. And so you still got to get across all the important information in a shorter period of time. Yep. Okay. Shaka had a question, but I think I'll rephrase it. I think it was, what should I ask you that we don't know enough to ask already? I think that's what she's getting at. What questions should we be asking in this Q and A that, that we don't know enough to ask yet? Uh, what is the single most important killer of online events right now? And it is bad time management. I promise you, like this was okay. We got by, we dodged, first of all, you managed it really well. You ended the event officially when it was supposed to event, end, and then it was great because we could move on. If this was during the day, and I did a talk where I spoke about this the other day, if you have it, if we had this event from 10 to 11 in the morning, at 11.01, everybody else has another meeting in their diary. Your audience is all gone. And if the finals, if the first speaker went five minutes over and the final speaker has to finish at the end of the time and go five minutes late, nobody stays for that. Literally, the first speaker steals from the final speaker at the end of the event. Because at 11 a.m., my next Zoom call is scheduled, and I'm going to jump onto that call. Time management is 10 times more crucial and five times harder to do. We recommend TimeCube, uh, T-I-M-E-Q-U-B-E, uh, as a tool that you can use. That's, uh, I think it would be online.timecube.com or timecube.com slash online. This is a TimeCube. It's what I use to time myself during events as a little cube. and. I, push it and you can see it goes green and it times down. They've made a visual one that we recommend people try using. There we go, thank you very much. Uh, and they use one that they require there. And I think this is not this is an area that nobody is focusing on and it is murdering the end of people's events. Cool, we have three final questions. Um, so this is from Jason again. If you have followed all these steps, how do you get it out there if you have no database, if you don't have a database? 
just don't, if you, again, you don't have to have a big database. You just got to say something relevant to a few people. You can, you know, build, do lead generation to build some sort of audience. You can do things, but just start grinding and have an opinion on certain things. But bizarrely, LinkedIn is amazing because they're really, really good. And it's very easy to trend on LinkedIn. So you'll notice every post, I, I tried never to do this before, but being very, very, um, She's you know, adding on uh, the little hashtags to everything and, you know, presentation, online events, virtual events, things like this. Uh, I feel like every other post of mine trends somewhere on LinkedIn and so I gain more audience and more people. So you can build authority rather than network and people can be sharing it and engaging with you there. I saw that the question was, what's one thing that nobody knows about me? Uh, very few people know this, so I, that I'm a non-smoking, non-drinking, vegan introvert. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that uh, that people often get wrong. <laughs> okay, um, there was a question about how much work went in behind the scenes. Hill Marie, um, never sell your secret sauce. Um, you always have to prep. The preparation is essential. You never want to just <laughs> rock up, but at the same time, you don't want to 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 kill it. Um, online events are definitely easier from our perspective to manage, as you know, the physical event of event spacing, event management is is much more complicated, but in terms of the actual engagement, um, we always want to make sure that we're putting something out that people can benefit from, and that requires a bit of preparation, I think, from both our sides. Uh, Rich, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, the, the other thing is to realize that you've got to change your whole mindset around this space because at a normal event, you arrive there and then there's one technical crew handling all the technical equipment. At an online event with a thousand people, there are a thousand technical crews. And actually, you're running in a venue and the venue staff have gone home. So there's a whole bunch of other areas that you got to prepare for to make that to make that work. Uh, but the one thing just relative to us and our, our evolution as a business was that this was in no way a small thing. The entire organization got behind it. And that reason to believe that we spoke about to our customers is we had to have that as a reason to believe internal first. So we all believed in what we were doing long before everybody else joined the conversation and, and had to join on. And for us, making something, even that first product that nobody bought, that kept us busy at the beginning. And being busy was a blessing. A busyness was a gift at the beginning of lockdown. Everybody else was talking about not being busy. We were working our asses off. Yeah. One question I asked us from you, Rich. Do you think polls should be implemented in physical, engage physical events for engagements and why? Yes. Yeah, so in fact, so much so that we've actually partnered with a software system and we're going to be, uh, it's going to be question here, um, uh, dot missing link dot com. It will be, but uh, we've, we've actually gone work, started working with a company in Scotland and we've created our own system because I never want to go back to where I cannot be a polling audience in real time. And you can use services like poll everywhere. But what I realized is with the hybrid, I want to be able to engage with people, speak to people and do things just in real time. And I want to have a dashboard of my audience so that if I'm speaking, even if you guys are sitting in the crowd in front of me in, a, in an in-person event, you can still engage with me the same way that somebody uh, across the world will be able to do. I think in many ways as a level up, uh, I've now swallowed the red pill. I've now seen that engaging, having your audience as active participants of an event is way better than having them as passive prisoners at your event. And that's the difference. And these kind of events, we have to work harder because if we're not engaging, you leave and you go to another tab. Whereas in a, in a, in a live event, if we're not engaging, you can't leave the room. So I like the fact that this is forcing us to be more engaging and to actually force you guys to engage in the chat with us. And I think this is a level up experience that I want to take into all future talks and events that I try to give going forward. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> to our lovely audience, uh, make sure you sign up for the next Intersections of Change. Click the feedback form at the bottom of the form. There's a bit of a survey and an option to sign up for the series. Till next time, stay safe take care of each other, and continue moving forward to normal. Goodbye, everyone.